Thank you very much, uh, Esti. Um, Indeed, I'll, I'll describe observations, but I'll also describe uh, theory, astrophysics theory, which mathematicians may regard as close to observations, but we think of it as theory. Uh, and I wanted to start with this uh, slide, uh, since today is the evening of the Chinese New Year. And so on the left, you see a depiction of a, a goat. I mean, it does look like a goat. And that's the symbol for uh, the New Year. Uh, on the right side, you see actually what nature produces, which looks pretty similar to that, uh, except that it's uh, on the scale of uh, 100,000 light years. Uh, and what you see here is a jet uh, ejected by a central black hole that we can't see, a tiny region of space that produces this huge jet stretching across the entire galaxy. And here in the middle, you see the dust lane of that galaxy. And so to celebrate the new year, we might as well look on this side. And that will be the side that I'll focus on in this talk. So the topics that I'll dis discuss today are several. Uh, I'll start with imaging black hole silhouettes. Uh, the black hole itself is a dark region. It doesn't emit any light, but material around it emits light. And it, the, the black hole casts a shadow, and I'll discuss it. We have the technology, actually, to image that shadow. Uh, I'll, I'll then talk about uh, pairs of black holes, black hole binaries. Just like with humans, uh, when you put two black holes together, they form a binary system that is stable. If you put a third one, it's unstable, just like with humans, again. Um, and then I'll discuss uh, the recoil of black holes as a result of either a merger of a binary or a triple system, three black holes, kicking one of them at large speeds. Um, then I'll discuss the fate of stars uh, near black holes. In particular, uh, we wrote a couple of papers over the past few months with uh, a postdoc, uh, James Guillechon, about the possibility of accelerating stars like the sun close to the speed of light, which is quite remarkable if you think about it, uh, near black holes. And the, uh, near a pair of black holes, and the pair of black holes uh, acts as a slingshot that ejects a, a star. Uh, if a star gets too close to a black hole, it can be disrupted by the tide that is raised on the star, just like tides raise, raised by the moon uh, are observed uh, in the oceans on Earth. Uh, when you get close to a black hole, uh, the tide is so strong that a star can be ripped apart. And uh, finally, I'll discuss the possibility that very small black holes may have been produced in the Big Bang. And in principle, they can account for the dark matter in the universe, whose nature we don't know. So the story starts 100 years ago, actually exactly 100 years ago. Uh, this is a special year uh, during which there are lots of conferences celebrating the general theory of relativity. Uh, Einstein wrote the equations and published uh, the first paper um, around the November two um, 1915. And a month later, Carl Schwarzschild found an analytic solution to the equations that Einstein, Einstein did not appreciate. He was, at that time, he was at the German front uh, after he joined the, the military in Germany. Uh, and uh, he sent a postcard to Einstein telling him that he found an analytic solution for a point mass. Einstein was thrilled to get this postcard and communicated its content to uh, the Berlin Academy. And a year later, Karl Schwarzschild uh, died at the German front. So the lesson from this story is that if you want to work out the full consequences of a theory, for an extended period of time, uh, you're better off being a pacifist. Because both of them were German Jews. Uh, the difference was that Einstein was a pacifist and Karl Schwarzschild was uh, a patriot. So he volunteered to the German army. He was back then the director of the Potsdam uh, Observatory. Nevertheless, he gave up on his academic pursuit, joined the army, and fought and found his death within a year, but he managed to solve, uh, to find this solution. 
by the way, when I mentioned this joke uh, uh, in a colloquium I gave in Germany, uh, there was not much laughter in the audience. <laughs> Uh, and Schwarzschild's solution is actually uh, the full solution for a point mass uh, in spherical symmetry. And it's characterized by a singularity, a physical singularity at, in the middle, meaning that if you were to make a black hole by collapsing a star or a cloud of gas, then the density of the matter will diverge at a given point uh, in space. And at that point, uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity breaks down. That's why we call it a singularity. That means that the theory is incomplete. And we know why it's incomplete. Because on very small scales, you have to incorporate quantum mechanics. So we have the theory of quantum mechanics on the one hand, the theory of gravity on the other hand. And we would like to marry the two. Einstein himself tried to do that without uh, success. These days, there are hundreds of or maybe thousands of string theorists attempting to do that. Uh, it's one of the frontiers in, in theoretical physics, uh, but we don't have that theory as of yet. So at the moment, we don't really know what happens near the singularity of a black hole. It would be nice to know. One way to find out is to jump into one of these astrophysical black holes that I'm talking about. Problem is that once you get there, you won't be able to write a paper and publish it because the information cannot go out. A black hole is the ultimate prison you can get in, you can check in, but you can never check out. And there is this horizon, the Schwarzschild horizon, at a distance of twice times Newton's constant times the mass of the black hole divided by the speed of light squared, uh, inside of which there could be no communication to the outside world. What you see here as these lines are trajectories of photons, particles of light that have zero mass, uh, if they are directed towards the black hole, they get absorbed. If they are directed from this point outwards, they may escape. And there is this photon orbit that for a Schwarzschild black hole, a non-spinning black hole, is uh, one and a half times the Schwarzschild radius, uh, where a photon can execute a circular orbit. So in fact, at that radius, if you were to look straight, you might see your back, because photons coming from your back will reach your head. So a photon is gravitationally bound to a circular orbit at this radius. Uh, and you can see that, um, in principle, what an observer at infinity sees, if the observer is sitting on this side of the black hole, uh, the observer will see a shadow cast by the black hole. So the question is, what happens to an observer close to the black hole? And, and that question was addressed in the movie Interstellar. And to address this question, Kip Thorne, in, in collaboration with a, with a variety of people, uh, imagined a camera located near a black hole and asked, what will the camera see, uh, taking into account the effects of uh, the deflection of light gravitational lensing? Uh, and um, time dilation, and, and so forth. Um, and that's the image that they came up with for a black hole surrounded by a disk of gas that is emitting radiation that you can see in the movie. Uh, frankly, I, I, I didn't enjoy much this movie because uh, the science uh, was not accurate and the plot other than that was not particularly exciting. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, this is the image produced, and in fact, it was just posted on, on the archive on AstroPH uh, last week. So you can read more about it in this uh, archive paper, how they produced it. In the past, people, scientists, did not really worry about a camera next to a black hole because nobody wants to be close to a black hole. Uh, so in fact, we want to test the structure of space-time near a black hole to check whether Schwarzschild uh, was right 100 years ago. And so one aspect of it is testing the general theory of relativity. The other one is testing uh, the physics of uh, gas accretion, the infall of gas into the black hole. Uh, usually because of the strong gravity, the black hole sucks uh, matter from the surrounding galaxy. And that's the matter we see. Um, 
And so uh, the, over the past uh, 30 years or so, there were theories for how this matter behaves. In particular, if the matter is cold, it makes an accretion disk uh, in which matter, just like uh, near a faucet, matter is spiraling into the black hole by losing angular momentum through viscosity or, or viscous stress. Um, and we would like to test these theories. By now, there are numerical simulations of that process. The second aspect, as I mentioned, is testing general relativity uh, in the strong gravity limit. So the, uh, one important aspect of Schwarzschild's solution is the existence of an event horizon, uh, which is a one-way membrane. Uh, matter can fall in but cannot get, go out. And if there was a hard surface, of course, matter impinging on the black hole would radiate much more energy. So we can easily uh, test whether a, bl a black hole horizon exists if we could image the vicinity of the black hole. Uh, there were some papers recently talking about quantum effects that may show up in the context of, uh, for example, firewalls, uh, something like a surface, although it may be hidden just behind the horizon. So if there is anything pathological, anything unusual that may exist around the black hole, we would like to see it. There are, of course, paradoxes about um, black holes. For example, the information paradox, uh, matter falls in, uh, carrying a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of information, but the black hole itself can be characterized only by three numbers. Its mass, its spin, uh, the level of rotation that it has, and its charge. And in astrophysics, black holes do not have significant charges because if it had a charge, uh, opposite charges would immediately accrete onto it and cancel each charge, make, make it neutral. So we actually have only two numbers, and the question is, where does this information go? Uh, and of course, the, there is the process of Hawking evaporation, where radiation is emitted from the black hole, so perhaps that carries uh, some of the information. But recent uh, studies of that process uh, say that, no, it's actually not there. So um, this is an unresolved uh, puzzle in fundamental physics, the information paradox. There is also uh, the breakdown of general relativity at the singularity that I spoke about before. So clearly black holes are good e experimental laboratories for getting to study physics beyond uh, the standard model that we have right now. So let's uh, talk about the, bla the biggest black hole closest to us, which is a uh, black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius A star. We know that it's a black hole because we can monitor the orbits of stars close to it, just like planets in the solar system tell us what the mass of the sun is. We can infer that the mass of the central object is about four million solar masses, four million times the mass of the sun. And it's very compact. The tightest orbit of, star, of a star around the black hole is as big as the solar system. And so we, within a scale of the solar system, we need to pack four million times the mass of the sun. No way of pack, there is no way of packing this with ordinary matter such that the matter would be stable and not collapse to a black hole. And so we are pretty confident since we don't see that matter and it looks like a dark object that is weighing a lot and it's extremely dense uh, that this is a black hole. Now, not on, uh, over the past uh, three years, we haven't only seen stars orbiting the black hole. In, in one set of observations, there was actually evidence for a cloud, a gas cloud, approaching uh, the vicinity of the black hole. Uh, this is an artist depiction, a, 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 a simulation of the behavior of the gas cloud. In fact, this particular simulation in which the, in which the cloud is held by external pressure uh, is ruled out because, as you can see from the date, uh, when the cloud passes near the black hole, it was supposed to be uh, disrupted, and it was not. Actually, it passed earlier uh, this year, or, or a few months ago. Uh, the cloud was discovered back in 2012, uh, and you can see um, how it moves uh, on the sky. Uh, it, ha it moves at a, sp at a speed of a few thousand kilometers per second. Uh, and it has roughly the mass of three Earths um, and the size of the solar system, roughly. 
And you can see the trajectory of this cloud here in uh, bracket gamma radiation. This is a particular line of hydrogen that allows us to uh, trace the cloud relative to the background. Uh, one, there are various ways of making such a cloud. One is to have a star in the middle that we proposed with uh, Ruth Murray Clay here at the Center for Astrophysics. Another one which appears more plausible at the moment uh, is a model uh, that we proposed with the postdoc James Gwilichon where uh, this, this uh, cloud is one out of several uh, P's that on, on a bead. Uh, so th these are, um, on a, you can imagine a stream of gas on in, that fragments into clumps and one of these clumps is passing near the black hole right now. There are more clumps along the way. And this stream of gas was produced by ripping out the outer envelope of a star. So there is a star which is not in the middle of the gas cloud. It's somewhere else, but uh, it basically shed off a fraction of its envelope. And that's the stream of gas that is now clumping. And we see one of these gas clouds. And when I was asked by the New York Times about uh, what the origin of this cloud might be, I, I, I was able to say something that made it to the quotation of the day back uh, a year ago, uh, I said that the experience is as exciting for astronomers as it is for parents taking the first photos of their infant eating. And the experience here uh, is watching the black hole being spoon-fed by a star passing near it. So astronomers do like the, to watch this process going of spoon-feeding the black hole in real time. During our lifetime, we can see this cloud moving around the black hole and possibly feeding it. Now, the special thing about Sagittarius A star, the, this black hole at the center of the Milky Way, is that it's the largest on the sky. If we wanted to image the silhouette, uh, you would like to look at the, the, the black hole that is the biggest on the sky. And this is Sagittarius A star. And one can imagine sending a technician, for example, this Verizon technician from a commercial a few years ago uh, that goes around and asks, can you hear me now? Uh, you can send that person <laughs> to the vicinity of Sagittarius A star. And you can imagine what would happen uh, as this person gets closer and closer. First, it, it encounters the, he encounters the innermost stable circular orbit. Uh, and that means that uh, if once he gets inside of it, he cannot move on a stable circular orbit around the black hole. Uh, that's at three times the Schwarzschild radius. Then he gets to the photon orbit, which is one and a half times the Schwarzschild radius. Eventually, he gets to the Schwarzschild radius. Now, nothing would happen to his body at that point because the black hole is four million solar masses. The tidal force across a couple of meters, roughly the height of that person, the difference in force between his legs and his head, it's not large. The overall acceleration is almost a million times the acceleration on the surface of the Earth. But it acts almost uniformly on the body of this person. So a person in free fall actually doesn't feel anything due to gravity. This was Einstein's insight that if you are in a free falling elevator, you won't be able to tell that you are in a gravitational field. And so the only way to tell is if there is a difference in forces between your head and, and your toes. And that actually happens eventually. Within 10 minutes, uh, this person, once it crosses the, the photon orbit, within 10 minutes it will reach the singularity and then be ripped apart. Uh, and of course, uh, we would see from outside this person getting uh, redder and redder with his voice getting sort of dilated. Uh, we will never see him crossing the horizon, but from in his frame of reference, he would actually fall all the way to the singularity within 10 minutes. Uh, black holes were called originally frozen stars because people thought of it, if you make a black hole from a star that is collapsing, at infinity you see the matter only reaching the horizon. So it's sort of like a frozen image. And by the way, uh, the same frozen image occurs in cosmology. Uh, now it seems like the universe has a horizon, the, the Sitter horizon. And when we look at galaxies as they exit from the, the Sitter horizon in the future, their image will be frozen, just like 
in the context of a black hole. In fact, there, there are lots of similarities there. Uh, so one way to probe the space-time that is very effective is to put a clock around the black hole that is moving in orbit. And you might think, oh, how do I put a clock in orbit? I mean, if you don't want to risk a technician going there, you might do it remotely. Um, and um, w we do have precise clocks in, in astronomy. In fact, uh, almost as precise as the best atomic clocks. And these are called pulsars. Uh, these are neutron stars that emit a beam of radiation and they, uh, the, the emission direction is uh, processing around the spin axis of the neutron star. And you see it like a lighthouse. You see a beacon of light passing uh, the telescope uh, every so often uh, periodically. And by timing the arrival time of these pulses, you can measure time and if there is a pulsar near a Sagittarius A star, that would be fantastic. We could actually map space-time. So that we proposed back uh, in 2004. And over the past decade, no pulsar was found in the vicinity uh, of Sagittarius A star only, uh, except for uh, last year, uh, actually two years ago, 2013, uh, there was a pulsar discovered uh, serendipitously by chance uh, unfortunately, this particular pulsar, which is very highly magnetized, it's called the magnetar, uh, is located um, a fraction of a light year away. So it's not really very close to the black hole. And the search is on for finding pulsars close in. So imagine a hotspot, not a pulsar, a hotspot in the accretion disk moving around. You see it in the upper right uh, panel. And that's the way the observer would see it. And here we are tilting the orbital plane uh, as a function of time. And you see that the image of this hotspot looks quite different depending on the inclination angle. There is one side that appears brighter than the other side, and this is simply due to the Doppler effect. The, the beaming as material is moving in the direction of the observer, uh, it shines more brightly due to sp special relativity. There is also the effect of gravitational lensing. Uh, uh, photon trajectories are deflected by gravity. So you can get more than one image. And in fact, uh, there are several images that one gets. You see it here in blue and green, uh, depending on the orientation of the orbital plane relative to the observer. Uh, there is the primary image from the hotspot. And then there is a secondary image where the photons are moving around the black hole and are seen from a different direction. And finally, there is a third image which is much fainter, where the photons uh, execute a full circle around the black hole and come back on the other side. And altogether, one gets an image that looks like a crescent uh, of the moon, for example. And you can see this crescent here. It depends, the, the exact shape of this uh, crescent depends on um, the inclination of the orbital plane. So what you see in the top panel is um, a, a hotspot orbiting 30 degrees um, uh, from the line of sight uh, without any spin to the black hole. So that's what you would get. Here again, a non-rotating black hole, a Schwarzschild black hole with no spin, but at 10 degrees uh, inclination. And at the bottom uh, panel, you see um, a rapidly spinning black hole. And you can see that the crescent looks a bit different. Of course, in all of these crescents, there is a dark region due to the fact that when radiation is emitted behind the black hole, it gets absorbed. The black hole catches these photons, as I was mentioning before, and you get a, a silhouette, a dark shadow of the black hole. And this shadow is uh, the signature of the event horizon. The scale of this shadow is of the order of 50 micro arc seconds. So if you are an amateur astronomer and you use a, back, a small telescope in your backyard, you can perhaps, under the best visibility conditions, reach a resolution, angular resolution of a few arc seconds. Here we are talking about a, a resolution which is uh, a factor of 100,000 better. And obviously, even the biggest telescopes in the visible light, in optical band, uh, cannot resolve such scales right now. Um, however, 
there is a, there, there is a way of detecting it, as I'll mention, in a few minutes. The spin of the black hole matters because the scale of the horizon depends on the spin. So here I, I plot the size of the horizon uh, in Schwarzschild radius units um, as a function of this norm normalized or dimensionless spin parameter. So a maximally spinning black hole has a spin parameter of 1. A counter-rotating black hole uh, spinning to the opposite direction has spin parameter of minus one. This is a black hole spinning at the speed of light opposite to the direction of motion of, of a test particle. Um, and you can see that the size of the horizon becomes roughly half the Schwarzschild radius, in fact exactly half the Schwarzschild radius for maximally spinning black holes. Then there is the innermost stable circular orbit, which is abbreviated as ISCO. Uh, and that's the, the smallest radius for a circular orbit that is stable. Uh, around the black hole. And for a counter-rotating orbit, this uh, is five times the Schwarzschild radius. For a co-rotating uh, test particle, it is the Schwarzschild, um, it, um, it is the Schwarzschild radius for a maximally rotating black hole. And it is um, roughly three uh, Schwarzschild radii for a low spin. Then there is the concept of the radiative efficiency. Uh, in principle, if matter can orbit on a circular orbit, it can release its binding energy in radiation. And the tighter the orbit is, the more radiation can come out. So the efficiency of converting rest mass into radiation depends on the radius of the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit. And for a, a spin parameter of unity, it can reach 42%. So, in fact, you can think of black holes as very uh, efficient engines that can convert up to 42% uh, of the rest mass of material into radiation. That's the most uh, efficient engines, uh, except for engines based on annihilation of matter. For a, a non-spinning black hole, the efficiency is 5.7%. Um, now here you can see uh, simulations of an accretion disk that has turbulence in it, uh, which show the image that an observer at a large distance would see. And there is still this shadow and crescent shape in red here, uh, but it's, uh, it also has some small scale structure due to the turbulence. And there are lots of details in such simulations that we are not sure about. For example, how the radiation is produced but roughly speaking, all of them show this crescent shape with a shadow in the middle. Now, why do we hope that to, to actually detect this shadow, to constrain it? Mother Nature was very kind to us. It's not always the case. There are problems in physics where you can work for decades, like the problem that string theorists are trying to tackle, and you are still not sure that you're on the right track. But in this case, Mother Nature was very kind to us. And there were, because there are three fortunate coincidences. One of them is that the matter falling into Sagittarius A star is transparent to um, radiation with a wavelength shorter than one millimeter. Um, and we are talking about radio waves emitted by the material. So Sagittarius A star was originally detected in, uh, in the radio. At wavelengths shorter than one millimeter, the material falling into Sagittarius A star right now is transparent to the radiation, to synchrotron self-absorption, which is the dominant absorption process. And this is just now. If more material were to fall into Sagittarius A star in the future, it would be opaque. We wouldn't be able to see all the way through. Another coincidence that has nothing to do with the first one is that uh, when you look at Sagittarius A star at radio wavelengths, there is intervening matter in, the, in our galaxy, which is blurring the image, scattering the radio waves. And it turns out that this blurring it becomes insignificant, again, for wavelengths shorter than one millimeter. So we can actually see the image of this silhouette without being 
uh, without the image being blurred by the interstellar medium of our galaxy. And finally, a third coincidence is that the scale of the horizon of Sagittarius A star and also the horizon of the black hole um, in a giant galaxy called the M87 uh, that is much farther away from us can be resolved as long as you build a telescope with an aperture that has the diameter of the Earth for a wavelength of one millimeter. So in other words, the resolution of a telescope is the wavelength of the radiation divided by the size of the aperture. That you can read in any textbook on optics. So if you take the wavelength of one millimeter and ask how big should my telescope be in order for me to resolve the shadow of Sagittarius A star, you find that it has to be just the size of the Earth. Okay, that sounds ridiculous. How can you build a telescope as big as the Earth? But it is possible. In fact, there was a senior thesis back in the 60s that uh, a student wrote with uh, John Wheeler on imaging black holes, and the student concluded that it's not feasible, and then moved to work in a different sub on a different field. Uh, he is now a professor at UC Davis. Uh, and I actually contacted him, and I said, said to him that it was the wrong move, because we can actually do it now. <laughs> but it's too late, I guess. For him. Um, and so um, these are images of the shadow of Sagittarius A star at different frequencies of radiation. The higher the frequency or the shorter the wavelength, uh, the less blurring you get by the interstellar medium and also the less absorption you get uh, by the material next to the black hole. So you get sharper images. Um, and the way to construct a telescope as big as the Earth is to have stations distributed around the Earth. And here you see the view of the Earth from the direction of Sagittarius A star. So if we were to sit on Sagittarius A star and look at the Earth, this is what we would see. And you see here uh, a number of millimeter observatories that can detect radiation at a wavelength of one millimeter. And if you were to measure not just the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave that arrives at these stations, but also the phase, you can correlate the arrival phase of the wave. And in principle, if you have a large enough number of stations, you can produce an image with a resolution on the scale of the black hole horizon. Um, and in fact, this observational <coughs> project is led by Shep Dolman that is sitting somewhere in this audience over there with his son, is it? Yes. Uh, and the idea is to connect these observatories and correlate the signal that is uh, detected at the different stations. So far, we have uh, looked, analyzed data from three stations that were correlated. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. In principle, there is this concept of the Event Horizon Telescope, the full-fledged system of all these telescopes connected to each other, not just three of them. And to show you an example of what such an array of, of uh, stations can do, uh, here you see um, a, a simulated image of Sagittarius A star with uh, lines indicating the polarization of the radiation coming from the material uh, near the black hole. Uh, this study was led by Mike Michael Johnson, uh, a postdoc at the Center for Astrophysics. Uh, and you can see the polarization uh, directions. And this is what the event horizon, the full event horizon telescope would be able to produce uh, to reconstruct from the observations. Uh, and we will not only get a sense of uh, how strong is the magnetic field near the black hole, but also its orientation. So that can be used to test theoretical models for what, how the gas behaves in the vicinity of the black hole. Right now, the Event Horizon Telescope is composed of these three stations. Uh, one is in uh, Hawaii. It's called the Submillimeter Array um, uh, SMA, uh, related uh, or led by the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory of the Harvard uh, Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And the second uh, is uh, JCMT uh, nearby to that in Hawaii. And then uh, 
Another station is in uh, California. Uh, it's called Karma, the abbreviation for that. Is, this is number two. And number three is um, the, in, in Arizona. And these three form a triangle that can be used to set constraints. We can't get an image of the shadow, but we can set constraints on it. And in fact, in a paper that we published uh, almost five years ago, we tried to fit the emission spectrum from uh, Sagittarius A star and get the best fit model to the set of uh, observational constraints that were available at that time. And we ended up with the conclusion that there is a probability distribution for spin parameters. And it's most likely a very low spin uh, for this black hole. We got a probability distribution for the inclination angle and another uh, orientation angle. So uh, this is good. Uh, we get close to Sagittarius A star, but, but no cigar in the sense that we don't have an image yet. There is another galaxy that I mentioned. It's called M87. Uh, it's a giant elliptical galaxy, uh, sort of the type of galaxy that we will become, that the Milky Way will become once it merges with Andromeda galaxy, its sister galaxy. Um, and so the black hole inferred in the middle of M87 has a mass that is much larger than the mass of Sagittarius A star by some th three orders of magnitude, almost a factor greater than, than 1,000, 1,400 times more massive than Sagittarius A star. But it's at a distance that is uh, 2,000 times greater than the distance of Sagittarius A star, because this is a distant galaxy. Uh, but if you take the ratio of these two numbers, you get the number of order unity, meaning that we can, in principle, hope to uh, image the shadow of this black hole. There is a big difference between M87 and the Milky Way in the sense that there is a jet, just like the jet I had in my first slide celebrating the Chinese New Year. This is the jet that you have in, a, in M87. Uh, and it's a very tightly collimated jet going all the way out. And usually theoretical models that produce a jet require the black hole to have a high spin. And so this black hole we know has a high spin, probably. Uh, and these are theoretical uh, uh, models of what the shadow around such a black hole might look like under different assumptions. That's a paper that we wrote with uh, Avery Broderick when he was a postdoc in our theory group. And you can see that the image near this black hole depends also on what you assume about the base of the jet and how the emission takes place in the vicinity of the black hole. So you can get different images. It's not just dependent on the spin, but it does depend on the spin. And this is from a Nature paper led by Shep, uh, published a couple of years ago, um, where uh, the size of the emitting region was constrained to be smaller than uh, the innermost stable circular orbit for a non-spinning black hole. So the conclusion from this paper was the black hole must have a spin because we can see emission from a scale. The base of the jet is coming from a scale that is smaller than the ISCO for a non-spinning black hole. In fact, if you do a detailed analysis trying to fit the image, you get that the spin has to be pretty close to unity. Uh, the spin parameter has to be bigger than uh, 0.9 or 0.96, depending on assumptions about the mass of the black hole. Now, um, obviously, if there is a black hole at the centers of galaxies, and almost every galaxy has a black hole at its center, uh, when two such galaxies merge, you make a black hole pair. The Milky Way itself will merge within a few billion years with the Andromeda galaxy. We see this galaxy coming at us. The night sky will change. It will be a spectacular event the, the, to watch, actually, as the Andromeda galaxy is colliding with the Milky Way. But we see these events on the sky quite frequently. And here is an example where you see two cores of galaxies coming together. And there are many more such examples where you see two cores of galaxies coming together at different separations. So here, the separation is close to uh, 30,000 light years at the top left. And at the bottom right, the separation is less than 6,000 light years. And beyond that, below that separation, it's very difficult to separate uh, with 
the resolution of these telescopes separate the two cores. But we believe that such cores of galaxies spiral towards each other because of friction, gravitational friction, dynamical friction on the background matter, background stars and gas. And eventually, the black holes themselves get very close to each other uh, after the stars surrounding them get stripped. And then eventually, they come together due to the emission of gravitational radiation. So here you see uh, two black holes close to each other uh, in X-rays. So this is a galaxy that has a lot of dust. You can't see much through the dust. But in X-rays, just like in the airport, you can actually image the center of this galaxy and tell that there are two centers of light. And here you see a, a double black hole system in the radio. Uh, and these black holes emit jets. So you can see two jets coming off. Uh, here is another example. There are plenty of examples. Um, this is the tightest black hole observed in the radio. The separation is around the 20 light years. Uh, and the total mass is estimated of the two black holes is estimated to be about a billion times bigger than the mass of the sun. Um, so um, one way to tell that a binary exists is to look for uh, periodic variation of the light. And uh, I analyzed this signature about uh, five years ago. Uh, where I argue that in principle you can find these binaries by looking for periodic modulation of the light and if you ask what would be the characteristic period when for example gravitational radiation takes over and starts to be domina uh, the dominant mechanism of bringing these two black holes together compared for example to the friction on the surrounding gas then you find that the period is uh, convenient it's uh, about seven years uh, uh, comparable to the duration of a PhD thesis in our department. <laughs> I'm not sure how long is a PhD thesis in math, but uh, you can always imagine the two black holes coming even closer. Um, and um, earlier, actually just a few weeks ago, um, there was a paper published in Nature arguing that perhaps there is evidence for such a system uh, where the period is of order five years. The evidence is not very strong because they have observed this system only for about eight years. But it's indicative and more data is needed to figure out if indeed this is a system that gets to the point where gravitational radiation takes over and this binary black hole system will merge in less than the age of the universe due to the emission of gravitational waves. Now, you don't have to stop at two black holes. As I mentioned, even among humans, there are triple systems. Uh, and uh, that can happen, for example, if two black holes are in the process of coming together, and then another galaxy comes in and joins the party. Uh, and then you can get three black hole systems. Um, and we calculated in some papers um, with um, Jirish Kulkarni and uh, Lauren Hoffman, uh, the likelihood of getting such uh, triple systems. And we figured that, in fact, uh, these are unstable, and, and one of the black holes get, gets ejected with speeds that can exceed a few thousand kilometers per second. So, uh, in principle, such a speed uh, would imply that the black hole crosses the diameter of the Earth. Uh, in a few seconds. Okay, so that it's, uh, these are very high speeds. And such black holes would escape from their host galaxy. <coughs> so you can find these uh, ejected black holes in the intergalactic medium. Uh, no. Uh, in fact, the most common cases are ones in which you have the third body being less massive because or two of them being less massive, because there are many more of those than massive black holes. Uh, here we see uh, a pair of black holes coming together by the emission of gravitational radiation. And this problem was very challenging uh, to solve uh, numerically with computer codes uh, until um, about five years ago, uh, where a breakthrough uh, was made. And, and right now, it's 
there are codes that solve uh, Einstein's equations in vacuum, except for two point masses orbiting each other, in full and calculate the emission of gravitational waves. And that's uh, what you saw here. Now, it turns out that when the two black holes come together, eventually they get to the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit, and then uh, the small black hole plunges into the big black hole. So the gravitational waves are emitted in a preferred direction. And by conservation of momentum, there is a rocket effect. The remnant black hole that results from the merger of the two black holes gets kicked in the opposite direction. And what you saw on the right-hand side is that the kicked black hole, the recoiled black hole, could in principle escape from the host galaxy. And so these numerical simulations were able to calculate what is the recoil speed. And we incorporated that into um, galaxy merger simulations with my former student, uh, Laura Blecka, and found that you could find recoiled black holes uh, moving out of galaxies just due to the gravitational wave emission, uh, the rocket effect from that. And then the question arise, arose uh, as to whether such systems are found on the sky. And uh, the best candidate uh, for such a system is shown here. Uh, these are two uh, centers of light that represent two black holes and they are uh, they have a relative speed of about a thousand kilometers per second and an offset of around uh, 7,000 uh, light years. Uh, just uh, a month ago, um, we uh, posted on the archive an interesting suggestion for detecting gravitational waves. So these gravitational waves that are emitted by uh, black hole pairs um, have very low frequencies. They have a characteristic, I mean, the two black holes, even in the, at the ISCO, uh, have an orbital time of order a thousand seconds if they have the mass of, of Sagittarius A star. So we're talking about a wave period of order a thousand seconds or a wave frequency of a millihertz. And NASA, together with uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, are promoting a concept to detect these waves in space. You can't do it on the ground because there is seismic noise, but you can, in principle, put laser beams uh, separated uh, apart that will measure the slight change in distances between the lasers as the gravitational wave is passing by. And that's the concept uh, for a mission that is planned for launch 20 years from now, just measuring the change in distances using interferometry. This is called the ELISA mission. Now, we thought of something different. Just over the past year, uh, the precision of atomic clocks uh, uh, improved dramatically by orders of magnitude. And so our suggestion was to use atomic clocks to detect gravitational waves. And the idea is as follows. Uh, there was a historic experiment that uh, tested Einstein's theory of gravity done at Jefferson Lab, the building next to this one. Uh, where the physics department is. Uh, it was done by uh, Pound and Rebka. So here you see one of them uh, at the basement of Jeff Jefferson Lab, talking on the phone with his colleague at the top of Jefferson Lab, and uh, measuring the frequency um, of uh, gamma ray photons emitted by uh, nuclei at the top of the building to be different due to the uh, gravitational redshift, due to the fact that the gravitational field of the Earth changes the frequency of the photons. And using the Mossbauer effect, they were able to reach a very high precision that allowed them to see this tiny shift due to the Earth's gravity. So here is the Earth causing the gravitational shift. Now imagine moving the Earth under the experiment back and forth, tying it with a rope and pulling the Earth and then pushing it. Well, one way to do that is to put another Earth in a binary orbit. Then obviously what Pound and Repka would find is a time-dependent time dilation effect or gravi time-dependent gravitational redshift effect that is changing periodically. This is a gravitational wave. So if you have a precise enough clock 
then you should be able to detect gravitational waves. And the idea that we proposed was now with the precision of um, atomic clocks, that uh, in particular optical lattice clocks, the technology of optical lattice clocks, uh, one can reach a precision of order 10 to the minus 18, one part in a million trillion. So in other words, over the age of the universe, such a clock would not be off the exact time by more than a second over 10 billion years. Uh, and if you put such clocks in a triangular configuration, for example, uh, around the orbit of the Earth, uh, around the Sun, um, and you shine laser beams that communicate the ticking rate of each clock, you would be able to tell that one, for example, if there is a passing gravitational wave and the two clocks are separated by half a wavelength, then you would be able to tell that they are ticking at different rates. Now, this is different from measuring changes in distances, the current design of ELISA, because you're basically uh, measuring the change in the ticking rate or the frequency uh, of the clocks relative to each other. You're not, you don't care about the fact that the distance changes. You just care about the fact that the clocks are not ticking. If they were synchronized to start with, you can record that they are ticking at different rates. At one half a wave period, at, at one time, one clock is faster than the other, and half a wave period later, uh, it's the other way around, and this repeats periodically. So this is a different concept than interferometry for measuring distances. And Well, the issue of comparing it to interferometry is a subtle one, and we are looking at it now. But the point is that the precision of these clocks of 10 to the minus 18 in, in fractional time precision is comparable to the amplitude of the gravitational waves that you would get from a binary black hole system that has a mass similar to Sagittarius A star at a gigaparsec. Okay? In fact, uh, such a binary system at a gigaparsec will have 10 times the amplitude. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, the amplitude is almost 10 to the minus 17 at a distance of gigaparsec, or 3 uh, billion light years, uh, for black holes with a million solar mass at a frequency of a millihertz, which actually corresponds to a half a wavelength comparable to the orbital radius of the Earth around the Sun. Okay, so that's a convenient uh, coincidence that the uh, orbital radius of the Earth around the Sun is just corresponding to the type of frequency you get from a binary black hole system. And uh, such a binary system, in fact, will coalesce within 10 wave periods. So if you catch it, it's very close to coalescing. And, and the period, the wave period, will change with time. There is this chirp that uh, makes the period get uh, shorter and shorter as the two black holes get closer and closer. So you can actually not only infer the mass of the system, but also the distance, because you have two equations. One telling you how the, the wave period or the wave frequency changes with time, and the other one telling you what the wave amplitude is. And you can constrain uh, the mass and the distance from this. Now, uh, when two black holes come together and one of them gets recoiled, uh, that means that black hole can get ejected from the host galaxy. So there is actually an interesting uh, prediction that one can make. The Milky Way galaxy was made out of building blocks. Early on in the universe, there were smaller galaxies, dwarf galaxies, that came together to make the Milky Way galaxy. So the earlier generations of galaxies were smaller than the present day galaxies that we have. And so you can imagine that whenever two dwarf galaxies came together, the two black holes at their centers joined, and due to uh, gravitational wave emission, uh, the uh, merger remnant uh, got recoiled. Now, the gravitational potential of the host dwarf galaxy is relatively shallow, much shallower than that of the Milky Way. It's usually, it corresponds to speeds of order 10 kilometers per second, whereas the Milky Way has a potential well uh, of uh, 200 kilometers per second. So the black holes typically get ejected with a speed of order a few hundred kilometers per second or less. And so uh, such black holes would get expelled from the host dwarf galaxy, but they would still remain bound 
to the region that eventually makes the Milky Way. And so what you would end up with are floating black holes in the halo of the Milky Way galaxy. That's a prediction from this process. And there should be of order 100 such black holes. Uh, we analyzed it in a paper with my former uh, graduate student, Ryan O'Leary. And they should carry uh, very compact star clusters that were taken with them. So you can look for these compact star clusters. And we looked at um, a survey of the sky called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and found some candidates for those that have to be looked at more carefully. Another interesting phenomenon that can take place is when you have two black holes with their star clusters due to the merger of two galaxies, it turns out that the two black holes uh, tend to uh, get into eccentric orbits. By scattering background stars, they tend to plunge towards each other. And when the secondary black hole, for example, gets very close to the primary black hole, the stars around that are tightly bound to the secondary black hole can get expelled. This is a slingshot effect. Im imagine the two black hole acting as slingshots and they eject the star gravitationally. Then you can end up with stars that are moving almost up to the speed of light. And together with James Bulletin, we calculated the statistics of such stars. And we found that uh, there could be stars reaching almost the speed of light. So think about it, if you are sitting, if you are occupying a planet next to such a star, this would be the journey of your life. The star would be ejected from the host galaxy, move through the universe, traverse it close to the speed of light, so you would be able to look at a vast volume of the universe. Um, almost uh, you would almost make the journey of, of a photon through the universe. And we are talking about real stars, you know, the stars like the sun are more massive than that. But of course, the numbers of very fast stars is small. There are more stars moving less than the speed of light. We call them semi-relativistic hypervelocity stars. And we define them as new cosmological messengers. Because if you, if you look at the literature on studying the universe, the study of cosmology, people use primarily photons particles of light, okay? And here you have the opportunity to use material objects that move almost at the same speed as photons and bridge across cosmological distances. So these are new cosmological messengers. And if you ask how many of them are there within, let's say, a distance of three billion light years, or one gigaparsec, depends on the, on the speed, but um, uh, you know, there could be uh, 10 to the power 15 such stars uh, moving uh, at a speed that is um, uh, about a tenth of the speed of light, um, but fewer of them uh, moving at the speed close to the speed of light of the order of uh, a few thousand. Now, when such stars move across the universe, this is the metric des describing our universe. As it turns out, our universe is very simple. Uh, once again, nature was kind. We think we might know why, but not sure yet. Um, basically, geometry is flat. Okay, so uh, the sum of angles in a triangle that you draw through the universe, and as you know, Riemann originally wanted to figure out if, the <laughs> if space is flat or not by drawing triangles. We now know that on the scale of the universe, the universe is flat. Okay, so. Uh, you can describe it with them, and, and it's also expanding. So this is the metric of a flat uh, spatial component of the metric, uh, expanding with a scale factor that is changing with time. So uh, the spatial scales are being stretched with time. And then there is the time component that is ticking at the same rate everywhere in the universe. And if you have material objects instead of photons that are emitted from a galaxy, uh, then their velocity would be uh, degraded or, or would be reduced as time goes on due to the expansion of the universe. The way to think of it is that in quantum mechanics, every particle has a de Broglie wavelength. And the de Broglie wavelength of a particle is just like the wavelength of light. It gets stretched by the expansion of the universe. And so for a massive particle, it could be a star or anything, 
uh, the De Broglie wavelength scales like 1 over the momentum or 1 over the velocity and it's being stretched like the scale factor so therefore the velocity is uh, reduced inversely with the scale factor. And uh, that's in difference from photons where the, velocity, the speed of light is constant. So you get a different relation between distance and travel time than you get for photons. And, I, um, and you get a change also in the brightness of the star uh, due to relativistic beaming. Uh, and a star could get deflected by an intervening galaxy due to the gravitational effect of that galaxy. Uh, the effect is similar to gravitational lensing. And so we calculated those effects. Uh, and you can find them in our paper. If the star gets too close to the black hole, then it can get ripped apart by the tide, as I mentioned. And such events occur once per 100,000 years for galaxies that have a single black hole. But the rate can be enhanced by almost a factor of 1,000 for black hole pairs. And black holes that are too massive, like more than 100 million times the mass of the sun, they would swallow the star whole. They would not rip it, rip it apart because the gravitational tide would be too weak. But, but black holes that are less massive than 100 million would rip apart a star like the sun. And the feeding rate of the black hole would be huge, um, and it could lead to outflows. So here you see a simulation that was made by my collaborator, Kimi Hayasaki, with my former student, Nick Stone, where you see a star being shredded into a spaghetti-like uh, stream of gas. This is called spaghettization of the star. And you can see this stream going around the black hole. In this case, the black hole has a spin, and it's counter-rotating. It's with a spin of minus 0 0.9, when the chance of the, of the stream intersecting itself is actually larger than if the stream, uh, the stream was uh, prograde, moving in the same direction as the spin of the black hole. Uh, and so you see the stream intersecting the stream of gas. This is the XY projection. This is the YZ projection of the same process. And eventually, the material intersects itself uh, and makes an accretion disk around the black hole. Now, this is the case where the gas is cooling very efficiently, so the stream becomes very thin in the simulation. This simulation was completed. I mean, the paper was posted uh, just last month. Um, and it's, it represents state-of-the-art calculations of this process. If you allow the gas to cool very efficiently, the situation is quite different. You can see here that the stream becomes very thick because it heats up due to the stream-stream collisions. And then you make a torus of gas that is rather thick around the black hole much more quickly. Uh, the tidal disruption uh, rate could be enhanced if the, the black hole has a recoil. For example, when two black holes come together, there would be gravitational wave emission. And after that, the black hole will be kicked. And then it will see fresh material that it can eat along the line of sight. So it can actually capture stars along the path of the recoil and produce many more tidal disruption events. We found with uh, Nick Stone, we found that roughly every 100 years, in such a case, you can get a disruption of a star. So there is a chance that a PhD student would see two such events coming from the same galaxy. And in fact, um, a, a couple of years ago, there was actually more than that, um, uh, three and a half years ago, there was one tidal disruption event of a star observed at a cosmological distance that uh, likely produced a jet pointed at the observer. And we can see such a jet, because it's so bright, all the way to the edge of the universe. And an interesting question about the jet is whether the jet will be aligned with the spin of the black hole, or whether it will be aligned with the orbital plane, I mean perpendicular to the orbital plane, of the debris from the disruption of the star. Because the debris from the disruption of the star has no knowledge of the spin axis of the black hole. So in principle, it can be aligned at an arbitrary angle. And then the question is, where will the jet go? Will it be aligned with the angular momentum vector of the orbit of the original star or with the spin of the black hole? Turns out that since this system with a jet was seen uh, 
steadily for two weeks without changing uh, in brightness, we can rule out the possibility that there is precession of a jet around the black hole spin axis. And the most likely situation is that, in fact, the jet was aligned with the black hole spin. So that's the conclusion we drew from that. Now let me uh, get to my final topic, which is primordial black holes. Black holes produced in the Big Bang. And in principle, if you imagine the universe at early times, uh, it was seeded with uh, density perturbations, inhomogeneities. And if you have a density enhancement of all the unity across the scale of the horizon of the universe, the universe itself, the horizon of the universe, will collapse to make a black hole. But since the horizon is very small at early cosmic times, you would make a tiny microscopic black hole with a microscopic mass. Uh, so this could be, for example, the, the dark matter. You could have some rare perturbations that made up the dark matter, because we won't be able to tell. Now, Hawking evaporation uh, would uh, eliminate all the black holes with masses less than an asteroid mass. But black holes with masses more than 10 to the 15 grams, more than the size of an asteroid, the mass of an asteroid, uh, have an evaporation time that is longer than the age of the universe. So they should still be around if they existed. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, such a black hole that has an asteroid mass has the size, the Schwarzschild radius of uh, the size of a proton, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. So if such a black hole passes through a proton, it will disintegrate the proton into quarks just due to gravity. That's quite remarkable. So just like I was talking before about destroying stars, here we are talking about destroying a proton with a black hole passing through it due to the gravitational tide. And a surgical passage of such low mass primordial black holes through the Earth uh, is difficult to detect uh, because it, the only thing it does is excite seismic waves. Uh, so the question is, is the dark matter made of such black holes? Uh, could it be primordial black holes? And we wrote a couple of papers with uh, a postdoc that worked with me, Paolo Pani, where we ruled out the possibility that the dark matter is made of such black holes. And the first uh, part of the argument had to do with black holes with a mass between the mass of the moon and the mass of the sun. Okay? And it turns out that if you take a black hole and surround it with a mirror, and this was argued back in the 70s, you take a black hole, put a mirror around it, a reflecting mirror, and let radiation bounce back and forth. If the black hole has spin, um, it, will turn, it turns out that uh, the spin energy of the black hole can be converted into low frequency electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength comparable or with a frequency comparable or lower than the spin frequency of the black hole. And you get a black hole bomb because the, the black hole uh, radiates these waves. They bounce off the mirror, come back, just like in a laser. They bounce back and forth between the mirror and the black hole, and they get amplified every time. And so you build up an energy density inside this cavity, spherical cavity, such that eventually you'll get an explosion. All you need to do is surround a black hole with mirrors. So is that at all? Uh, just an academic exercise? Well, for decades people thought, but, but then it occurred to me that, in fact, in the early universe, you know, if you look at these primordial black holes, they were sur surrounded by a mirror. It's called plasma, or uh, ionized gas, and it turns out that when you write the dispersion relation for a photon in an ionized gas, in a plasma, you can think of it as a massive particle. The frequency squared is equal to the plasma frequency squared plus the wave number squared times the speed of light squared. That's similar to having the energy squared of a massive particle equal to its mass squared times the speed of light to the fourth plus its momentum squared times the speed of light squared. So in fact, it's as if the photon acquires a mass. And if you think about it, uh, how does a mirror operate? When you look at a mirror, you see your reflection. The reason you see your reflection is because the plasma frequency Inside the metal, there is a silver uh, coating to the mirror, to the back side of, of the glass, which uh, is basically a metal uh, that has free electrons in it, electrons that are free to move, and it has some characteristic plasma frequency. 
related to the density of these free electrons. And you're looking at, at light where the frequency is smaller than the plasma frequency and therefore the light gets reflected. That's what a mirror is. So if you look at these primordial black holes and they are surrounded by a dense enough plasma in the early universe, they will act, the, the plasma will act as a mirror and you can extract the spin energy of these primordial black holes. It's very difficult to imagine them being formed without any spin. They would likely be formed with spin and you can extract this energy uh, and now, as the time goes on, this mirror will eventually disappear because the universe is expanding and the plasma frequency will go down, the density of matter will go down. And so you will end up with the energy that was stored inside this cavity being dissipated into the radiation field in the universe. And so you can end up with the energy distorting the cosmic microwave background. And we have limits on that. So by using those limits, you can actually rule out the possibility, this is the fraction of the dark matter that is in the form of primordial black holes as a function of their mass. And this mass is roughly the mass of the moon here, all the way up to the mass of the sun. We can rule out uh, the possibility that primordial black holes with even a little bit of spin uh, are the dark matter. Based on the fact that we haven't seen energy injection into the cosmic microwave background, in, uh, during the later history of the universe. So that's one argument. Then for lower mass black holes that have a mass uh, of the order of an asteroid mass, less than the mass of the moon, you can rule them out by considering neutron stars. Uh, so if such a black hole passes through a neutron star, a very dense star, then it turns out that it will excite modes inside the star and eventually get trapped and sink to the center of the neutron star and start eating up the neutron star. So turns out, if you do the calculation, and that's a very detailed calculation, that uh, the existence of neutron stars in the centers of galaxies where there is a lot of dark matter rules out the possibility that the dark matter is made of primordial black holes with masses between the mass of an asteroid and the mass of the moon. And once again, uh, you know, the, the limits are quite significant. So let me summarize the punchline of my talk. Uh, and in the first part, I talked about the Event Horizon Telescope, a very exciting uh, uh, frontier that uh, many of us are involved in. And in fact, we are now um, collaborating with um, Andy Strominger from the Physics Department, uh, with Peter Gallison that was here. Uh, and with STIAO uh, on this project, uh, together with a number of astronomers. Um, and the goal is to image the silhouette of uh, uh, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy and in M87 and constrain uh, general relativity or deviations from, from general relativity um, observationally. Um, and then um, I mentioned the uh, existence of pairs of black holes, black hole binaries, uh, that can be looked for in electromagnetic radiation. Uh, they can also accelerate stars close to the speed of light, which is quite remarkable, acting as slingshots. Uh, and when they coalesce, they get recoiled. And so you can look for uh, offset um, black holes from the center of galaxies and also for uh, floating star clusters in the Milky Way galaxy. And finally, uh, primordial black holes probably uh, uh, do not make up uh, the dark matter in the universe. Thank you. And I'll be glad to answer questions, especially from the students in, in this uh, class uh, 211 R black holes from A to Z. Well, I'm not a student in this class. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> So the question, the question was, what is the source of the radiation that we see coming from Sagittarius A star? 
This radiation uh, is thought to be emitted by electrons, relativistic electrons, gyrating.